Hi, I'm Melanie Chandra and you're watching Anoki Uncensored. Today's episode of Anoki Uncensored is entitled South Asian Representation in Hollywood. My guest for this discussion is Hollywood actress and producer Melanie Chandra. Here's a little bit about her before we begin. As an actress and producer, she is passionate about bringing more empathy into this world through her work. In line with that mission, she uses her platforms both on screen and behind the camera to share powerful and diverse stories about women and minorities. Born in Illinois, Melanie graduated from Stanford University with a degree in mechanical engineering while studying improv comedy on the side. Post-graduation, she landed a high-profile corporate job, which she eventually quit to pursue her childhood dream of acting. She quickly landed a series of television roles, including guest appearances on Rules of Engagement, Parenthood, and Nashville, and large reoccurring roles on Netflix's Brown Nation and HBO's The Brink. From 2015 to 2017, she played the series regular role of Dr. Malaya Pineda on the CBC medical drama, Code Black. In 2018, Melanie also became a producer for several different projects and shows. One of her projects with South Asian women in the forefront is in development with HBO. Melanie is also the co-founder of the not-for-profit organization called Hospital for Hope India, which provides healthcare services to underserviced villagers in rural India. And also, she holds a second degree black belt in karate and is a trained pianist. And that's just the beginning, folks. Please welcome my girl to the show, the fabulous Melanie Chandra. Thank you so much for being here, sweetheart. Thank you for reaching out. I'm very excited about this. Oh my gosh, this is just going to be great. So I've got so much to talk to you about and I'm afraid of running out of time. Um, so I'm going to just go straight into my very first question, Melanie. All right. So let's start by talking about your history first, because you've had rather an unconventional journey into acting, first having trained at Stanford, no less, um, as a mechanical engineer. So if you can bridge that gap for the start of our conversation, um, and then we can carry on. Sure. From, from engineering to entertainment, I guess that's the bridge you're looking at. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll take it back just a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. So I, I grew up in the Midwest, um, very humble beginnings, middle class. Mom was a nurse, dad was a med tech, and I was super shy and introverted growing up. So shy, like doing one of these things like scares me every time. So, but you're the best. So I'm glad oh, I can do this baby. with you. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was I was very creative when I was young. I was uh, very much into drawing. I would go to the library, take out all the, the sketch drawing books. That would be my hobby. I would dance and I was really into the piano. But um, being Indian and having yes. extended family members that were engineers, it was ingrained in me at a young age that if you're good at math or science, which I really was into it, uh, you should be an engineer. And it wasn't my parents. My parents weren't the one telling me you have to be an engineer. It was almost, it was more cultural conditioning. It was, right. wow, we really respect Uncle Raju. You know, he went to IIT and look at this great job he has and we need more women engineers. So I just set myself on that track. I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I should be an engineer too and my parents will be proud and I'll make money and I'll, you know, support my family that way. But I'd always dreamed of being an actor always dreamed of being an actor, but I never saw anybody that looked like me doing it. And that's, I think it was just out of mind. I didn't know right. at that age, I didn't even consider becoming an actor. It was a dream, but I never thought, wow, I can actually be that person on screen. I can do uh, it and, and get paid kind of thing, right? I can do that and get paid. You yeah. know, everything and everyone in my community that did theater, they were white and they were privileged. And I just felt like that was that that was out of reach from me. Right. And it wasn't until so then I, I got my engineering degree. I moved to New York. I got the the job in corporate America. That everybody I, dreams to get, right? Yeah, it was it was one of those things when you're in college, everyone's recruiting for this company or that company. And um, I got caught up in the whole thing. And I'm like, wow, if I if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna get the best job, I'm gonna work in New York City. And I got the job. Right. And it was, it was awesome. And I was working with incredibly smart people and it was super diverse. And I was in New York city. 
you know? I mean, this Early is 20s. the center of creativity, right? This is the center yes. of that kind of, you know, dream in the back of your head. That's kind yes. of calling your name like serendipitously. It was almost like destiny brought you to the center of the universe of creativity in North America. Yes. yes. And I think it was all these micro decisions along the way in my life that kept getting me toward, toward this, toward this goal. Right. right. But I never, I never said it out loud. This is what I'm going to do. And so I found that that curiosity I had when I was a young girl, I found that just expand when I was in New York because there's, improv shows and theater and just it's cultural immersion. So of I decided to Google acting class and I took an acting class and this is while I was working full time. And um, even though the teacher told me I wasn't that good to start, I just knew that something was in me and this is what I really love to be learning. And so I was moonlighting, I was taking my acting classes, I was working full time. And um, along the way, I actually met a mutual friend of ours. I never, I never told you this story, but- Tell uh, me. Pooj Pooja Kumar. Oh my God, my girl Pooj. So I was working full time and then I was kind of dabbling with acting and all this stuff and I met her and she was the first Indian American actress I had ever right. met in my right. life. That was right. just doing that. She didn't have a side job. She was just doing that. Right. And I think she was also doing commercials and print modeling and all of that. And I was like, wow, she's, she said to me, she's like, if I can do this, you can do this, Melanie. Yeah. I think you're very talented. She didn't even see my work, but she's like, I can tell you're very talented. She wow. gave me that boost of confidence. I saw yeah. myself in her. And she's like, you know what? I can introduce you to my print modeling agent if you want, if you're looking to do that kind of work. Yeah. And so when I was towards the end of my corporate career, I, I explored that and I got represented as a print model and I started making money on the side. Yeah. I started saving up some wow. cash. Wow. <laughs> and um, when I finally made the decision to leave my job, I had some savings and I had some steady work doing right. print modeling. And then I, and then I spent the rest of the time just training as an actor, doing a bunch of student films and small theater projects you know i was i started as you know laughing girl number five at a party in you know in a student <laughs> film and just just worked my way up but uh it's definitely been a long journey but i would say that's sorry that was a longer version but that was no, the bridge no absolutely and yeah. and it's really interesting because i remember when i met you in the days when you were modeling and i remember you know you you know not actually realizing how stunningly beautiful you were because, you know, you came from kind of this academic background, right? Where kind of you were more cerebral. So the whole kind of focus on, you know, what you look like and, you know, how that translates over to other people wasn't really something I saw that you had at that time, which I think kind of made you stand out. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that, I mean, I feel that kind of makes you stand out also in the kind of actor that you are as well. Let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, it was shortly thereafter that you started to get these like TV gigs, right? Let's, let's, let's move into that direction. A number of first smaller gigs to then getting more substantive gigs to then finally, you know, getting a, a kind of season regular with Code mm -hmm. Black. Let's, let's go through that journey of the bit parts to the more substantive parts to then getting this kind of dream position. Mm, sure, so I, uh, I was doing a bunch of small independent things in New York and then in 2012, I moved to Los Angeles and I had um, what I call a champion there. I think what's important along this creative journey is you're gonna find different champions. Right. So I met a champion in New York who was just starting out at a talent agency um, as an assistant. And he's one of those people, just like Pooja Kumar, he's like, why are you working two jobs? You should be doing this full time. Like right. there's something in new, like, he believed in me, right? right? He's like, I'm moving out to LA to work for a bigger agent, you know, a bigger agent. Maybe yeah. I can help you. Shall you ever decide to quit your job? So quit my job in New York. A year later, moved to LA, I called him. I'm like, hey, I'm here. He started submitting me for auditions. I wasn't officially repped by the agency. And I happened to book one of my first auditions, which was a guest star, a one-off on a sitcom called Rules of Engagement with David yes. Spade. Yes. And it was in front of a live studio, studio audience. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just had a bunch of fun. And 
um, I, you know, I really, I felt very grateful and lucky. And then from there, I just, I started booking um, some more one-off guest stars right. and things were great. You know, new girl in LA, things are awesome booking, but then I just hit a lull. Right. <laughs> I just didn't As you do a really long time. Yeah. And then um, and what did you do? What did you do in that hi hiatus time between first, you know, getting these gigs and then having that kind of gap before you went to that next phase in your career as an actress? I, um, I went and found, was looking for a new, a new acting program in LA. Maybe I okay. could work on something in my craft. Um, yeah. I also had to do a lot, a lot of work on me because I think through that process, I lost a lot of confidence when you right. don't book um, for a while. And I haven't been, I hadn't been in this industry long enough to get the perspective that if you don't book a job, it's not about you. It's just the chances of booking an audition, booking a job is just so small, so right. small in Hollywood. And for a period of time, I took it personally. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? So during that time, I had to do a lot of work on myself too. I started doing some meditation and a yeah. lot more self care, but also I made sure that I was um, finding the right acting class because I also found that there are a lot of teachers in Hollywood that are great, but then there's also ones that are great names, um, but they might not be right for you. And right. there's a Hollywood approach to, to acting and acting for TV and film. But I was, I think I was yearning for more of a foundation of right. craft um, that I had started in New York. And then when I went to LA, it was more like, here's how you audition. But for me, it wasn't it wasn't sinking in, and I don't. I don't think I had the um, the experience that at that time to know how to apply it. So, absolutely, so yeah. yeah. So, but I think the growth um, period that you went through was something that you know, uh, you know, you needed as a person yourself. Because let's think, let's break this down for a second, right? You came from this kind of, you know, scientific background for want of a better way of describing your academic, your academic journey. Um, mm -hmm. Prior to that, you, you know, you were a South Asian, still are, of course, but a <laughs> South, you know, brought up as a South Asian young lady, right? Mm -hmm. And then you factor in your exposure to kind of like the Big Apple and just, you know, finally being able to, you know, see that, you know, there are people out there who do what I'm dreaming of as a mm -hmm. living, that there is an opportunity here and then starting to meet kind of these angels, for want of a better word, like people mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of put it in your ear subliminally that you can do this, Melanie, right? You've mm -hmm. got the talent. Plus, the other thing I find with, you know, successful actors that I've spoken to is that, you know, when they come from kind of that strong academic background like you have, is they always, you know, they've said to me that they feel like they have an upper hand to other creatives because they've learned how to be disciplined and to buckle down and to do the work that's yeah. required to be yeah. able to kind of grow yourself to, 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 to kind of where you become more diverse as an, as, a, as an actor. Do you feel mm -hmm. that that's been a part of your journey? Because it sounds like it has. I, I think there, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's a couple of things. One with the academic rigor, right? It's, yes. there's two sides of it. One is the worth ethic and yep. you're, you're constantly working hard until you find the answer. But the other side of it that I've tried to unlearn is that um, in engineering, there's always an answer. In ah, creativity, yes. there's usually not an answer. There's just a launch and then you, there's perspective and then you yeah. see where it goes. So a lot of my, my work as an actor has been unraveling the, um, the structure, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, it does make sense. Yeah. So, and being okay with being messy and right. of course, like vulnerability, that's the number one. But when you work in corporate America too, what do you do when you're in your early twenties and you're speaking to CEOs in New York city, pretending like, you know, everything. <laughs> I still Don't pretend well like I know everything. I still, pretend, you, I still pretend like I know everything. <laughs> you're good at that. Oh my gosh. So we had a question from um, someone here in the Instagram feed um, asking Melanie, when did you actually go to Hollywood? When did I actually go to Hollywood? I, 2011 was my first big gig. Wow. So yeah. it, was quite, it was relatively a short period of time when you think that, you know, typically they say on average, you know, you're in the field for a decade before you kind of get your first big, you know, break. It's interesting that, you know, you got, you know, a lot of smaller breaks 
then you have this kind of time to regroup and figure out who you are as a person and as an actor. Like, how do you translate that over into, you know, acting? And then you started to get these other larger roles. Let's go there. Like, when did that start happening for you? When did the larger roles start happening? Yeah. Um, it was... I think what, so I, I went through this huge lull, as I said, yeah. and then in 2013, I, um, I auditioned for the ABC Diversity Showcase in New York City, okay. um, run by the head of primetime casting in New York City, Marcy Phillips, who I attribute to launching my primetime career. Yay. Um, I went to a workshop with her. She was doing a casting director workshop and I never did those things, but someone mm -hmm. said, you should do this one. Marcy Phillips is good. So I did that. She emailed me after and during the workshop, you present scenes in front of everybody and she gives you feedback. And she emailed me after she's like, Hey, I think you're, I think, you're, you know, you're really talented, da, da, da. you should go to the final round for this diversity showcase. I'll push you for it. So I was like, wow, this is really cool. Okay. If she says so, I'll, I'll do it. Right. And then, and then I got in and it's, wow. it's great because lots of people audition for these things. And so I'm sitting there, there's, I think 12 of us yeah. and we're preparing for this big showcase in front of the industry in New York and lots of agents and managers and other casting folks come and watch that. Right. Um, so nothing came of the showcase directly, but because of the relationship and the But what about your confidence? Was... What about your confidence? Oh um, yeah, that, that was like- Remember that was a bit of an issue for you? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hate to say, I won't say that my confidence was attributed to booking something, but it was like, um, it just picked the momentum back. Right. right. Confidence is so, so fleeting, right? You can have a, yes. like if my hair's flat right now, my confidence is bad, right? It's just like- <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, like, it's like, woman. A, that audition will, will do that for you. Um, I've always had the faith. Like I've always had the faith that something was good in store for me, but there were moments where I lost the confidence and that, that moment just helped me pick up the momentum. But from there, um, I was so used to performing in front of people. I was just in a rhythm. Right. right. And then I had an audition for the brink, which is right. an HBO show. It only had yeah. one season. Um, but that was a big opportunity for me. It was, um, I thought it was a small role, um, for like one episode in the, one, one episode, the pilot, I got to play Asif Monvi's younger sister and opposite Jack Black. And work with Jim Robbins. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. Um, so I, I booked it. I auditioned, I did the callback and everything went to LA and, uh, I was like, wow, that was a good callback. Didn't hear back for a month. I, was, I just forgot about it. And then my agent called said, Oh, you remember that thing you auditioned for? You got the part. I was like, awesome. That's great. And, um, I shot the pilot and then they yeah. kept bringing me back for more and more episodes, oh my which gosh. was unreal. And then from there, the following pilot season, that's when I was auditioning like crazy for series regulars, right. um, for all the networks. And that was an unreal year too, because you go as actors, you audition for so many, so many things, but pilots, you know, that's like a huge, everyone's trying to book a pilot. Absolutely. And so if you have an agent, you're in LA or New York, you're auditioning, you're self-taping for these things. I would have so many auditions a week and I was so burnt out and I was doing a good job. Again, I put in my work, Yes. my homework, put in my yep. work. I had momentum. I had my, I'm like, I can do this. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And it was a Friday. And I had three test offers from three different networks My for gosh. serious regulars. And I was like, what are the odds? What eh? is happening universe? And so yes. Yes. Um, one was for CW, one was for Fox, and then one was for CBS, which is code black. Yes. And, then and why did you take that one? Why did you take that one? Um, all of them seemed really appealing. Um, this one, well, truth be told, I, uh, so with a test deal, you're supposed to come out to LA and do the final, final round. Right. Okay. And so you negotiate all of those terms. Right. And, um, I had ranked actually a different show above code block. So I was going to put that first position. Okay. And, um, good thing I didn't do that because it actually didn't get picked up as a, as a show. But Code Black found out, this is the Hollywood game, right? When of they course. find out you're in demand from with somebody else, then they'll come back with an offer. So Code Black, again, I'm just like, what is happening here? On the same day, came back with an offer. 
Like you don't have to come to LA. You don't have to do the final run testing. We showed your tape to the network to my, my audition. Right. Like, here's your contract, take it or leave it. I oh my like, gosh. <laughs> uh, so I can go to LA next week, take my chances and do the final round for the last, for the other two shows. Yeah. Or I can take this really great offer for an awesome show. I also really liked it. Yeah. Um, and then and you've already it. got it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really awesome. I mean, you know, it, that went on for like two years. I mean, you really became a household name during that time. I mean, tell me how life changed for you as an actor and as a person, you know, during that time. And then also since then. I think I felt like I had finally, like, People say the term working actor. I felt like I was finally doing it. Right. You know? I was in yes. LA, I was working mostly every day. It's a big ensemble show. So some days you're not working, but mostly every day I was working. I was waking up at 5 a.m., 5.30, going to set, drinking my tea, reading my sides, rehearsing, blocking, shooting, and then acting. Most of our job as actors is to try to get a job to act. That's right. So, but I finally found for the first time in my life for five months straight, I just got to act every day. Wow. And that felt great to me. Yeah. That felt great to me. Personally, it was hard because I had just gotten married. Right. I, and I was that. based, I was based in New York. So that was another thing I was, I was juggling is I had, I was engaged when we, when I auditioned for the show, yeah. um, I got married. I shot the pilot while I was planning our wedding. I went oh, off to my honeymoon. We were off the grid completely. We went to a safari off the grid wow. completely for two days. I turn on my phone. I have a hundred text messages. Melanie, where are you? Did you hear the news? Your show got picked up. And I'm like, that's awesome. And then I land back in New York City and I go to my agent's office to sign a contract yeah. for seven years. What? And I'm like, I just got married. I just, I'm like in New York and now the contract is for seven years in LA. And, and, a lot and that's of, in LA, right? Yeah. Uh, it's very mm. typical for network TV shows to do a seven year contract, even if, you know, they get canceled. Okay. Um, so that was, that was my heart just dropped also because, of course, you know, I wish I could have both in the same city. Yeah. Um, so, so we had to make do for the, the months out of the year I was shooting yeah. for the two seasons I was in, I had to, I was flying back and forth. We were flying and seeing each other nearly every single weekend. Oh, well, that's good that you made that work though. Yeah. We, yeah. I mean, you have to, takes, you have to otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I think that has also a lot to do with the fact that you're a very organized um, person as well. I'm telling you, it, it goes back to your training and, you know, mechanical engineering is really hectic and it's rigorous and it requires all kinds of discipline and all kinds of work ethic. And I feel that marriage, even relationships require the same kind of mentality um, of focus and drive and keep it going kind of, you know, attitude. Mm -hmm. Do you feel yeah. that? Do you feel that if you kind of look at it now that I'm talking about it? Do you feel there's some similarities in terms of, okay, I may not feel like doing this right now, but I, I, I've got to do it because, you know, there's a longer story here in what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. Yeah. Just, uh, I think about things now so differently than when I did when I first started and I was single, going crazy, running around, doing everything I wanted to because I wasn't, I didn't have a family. Right. And you know, when I was young, I'll be honest, I was like, maybe I don't need a family. Maybe I don't need this. I'll just be this independent career girl. But now I have a family and I'm so grateful because I, I think oh about gosh. it, right? Yeah. I think about when I'm 80 years old, mm -hmm. will I value having had a family or chasing a random guest star audition that probably is not, you know, it, you understand what I'm saying. I totally just going off for that one-off opposition. So it's it's definitely priority. So with any acting any act, acting opportunity now, you really have to you have to really consider like how is this gonna how can this work together? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like you found the magic formula, the magic pill, whatever you want to talk about it, because you know you've you know quite quickly kind of forayed into producing in addition to acting. 
I'd love to kind of go in that direction in our conversation, Melanie. Sure. I mean, you yeah. know, my sense of your personality is that you're not just someone that does one thing and then, okay, I've got a good thing going. I'm going to continue on with this. I really have a, a strong sense of your personality that, you know, okay, I need to bring people along the ride with me. I need mm -hmm. to lift other people up. And, and, and I feel that you're very clear on your identity as a South Asian woman um, as well. And I, I, and, and really what I'm saying here is, you know, this, this, this opportunity that, you know, you and your team got with HBO is very centered around kind of the female minority story. I mean, I don't know how much you can share right now, but share what you can, because I feel that this is quite purposeful for you to sure. kind of do this, you know? Sure. And I'll take a, a, a small step back. I think yeah. a lot of the... Um after working in primetime TV for the last few years and shooting, you know, with different networks. And I actually did a count the other day and I did that because I wanted to find a statistic, which I'll share in a second, but yeah. I've done roughly 50, 50 plus episodes of primetime TV. If you include, you know, Code Black, the two seasons, and then one-offs on other shows or recurrings. Um, that's, a, that's a good body of work in mainstream, sweetheart. It, it's, it feels substantial when you, we count it out, but then I'm yeah. like, but then I'm waiting, you know, nothing's happening for six months. But then you look back, you have to, you know, appreciate everything you've done. And I really do. And the, the reason I counted it, because I was thinking, how many female directors have I had? Yeah. How many people of color directors have I had? Yeah. I had, out of those 50 episodes of TV, I had two female directors, one person of color. Mm. And I was on sets that were very patriarchal. Yeah. Um, and being a minority, a woman of color, and just witnessing the dynamics and just having a group of men behind the cameras in the writer's room uh, as directors, just the people that are making all the decisions as a woman. And I, I'll speak for my other castmates too. I mean, we all have these conversations. It's very common. Yeah. But we just felt like we didn't have any power there were double standards mm -hmm. um there was a lack of respect yeah and especially any especially with minorities there's the women side of it and then there's the minority side and then there's the people of the women of color right out of 50 plus episodes of television i'd only worked with two female directors so that's 50 potential episodes of tv only two female directors and only one director that was a person of color. Mm -hmm. um, so being a woman in front of the camera um, and not having that sort of champion on the other side, yeah. uh, a lot of us felt um, like we weren't being listened to or we definitely didn't feel like we had any power. Right. We didn't have any really sway um, or influence in terms of the storytelling. Um, and I think things have changed a little bit because a lot of what I'm relating is pre Me Too. Right. But I mean, right. When I was working, I, I saw so much sexual harassment. Of course. <laughs> like, just like blatant things happening. And I'm like, this is not okay. Yeah. This is not okay. Yeah. Um, that's a completely, that's a separate issue. But um, for me, I just noticed that, wow, there's no people of color in the writer's rooms. Yeah. Anybody that was a person of color in any of these casts, they're not the main character. They're not the main story. They're the sidekick. They're not being fleshed out. Like, where's, yeah. Where is their story? Right. Um, and so that got me thinking. The only way we can change things is if we, we create those opportunities ourselves. It's not going to be the, the white men in charge. It's going to be a, let's give this person an opportunity and write a really, no, no, no. We, we hopefully, we can't rely on that happening is what mm. I'm saying. Right. And so. And we've already seen historically, you get the token roles, you get the roles that are kind of left over. You get like the, mm third or fourth, you know, lead, even if that, if and that's, if you're like really, really lucky. So, yeah. you know, it sounds to be that that dynamic just wasn't good enough for you. No, I mean, it's just not representative of what America is, right? hundred percent. Right. And, um, I had some stories I wanted to tell. Yeah. I wasn't sure if anyone would listen, but then I started talking to some people, yeah. um, some other friends in entertainment that were great writers, um, yeah. great 
entertainers and they started validating and like that's a great idea you should you know you should look into it yeah um and one thing led to another and i partnered with a really good friend of mine from stanford it was interesting we both found our way in entertainment um she's this prolific writer right now she's a one of the head writers on Insecure and HBO. Wow. And we uh, just maintain our relationship throughout the years. And she's, she's Nigerian American and obviously- okay. well, That's American. great. So you have yeah. like that whole other dynamic to the table, which is important because yeah. that's the other thing, right? Um, Melanie, is that, you know, I know we talk a lot about kind of, you know, the South Asian story, which is incredibly important because it's not getting enough access to mainstream audiences. So we need creators. We need people who are on the other side of the camera in addition to in front of the camera, which is the story you're telling. But yes. what's even more important, what's even more validating is kind of the hashtag, you know, representation matters. So what does that mean when you're thinking about, you know, the American market? It's mm -hmm. all of the above. It's all the minorities. So the fact that you guys decided to kind of come together here, uh, the yeah. dynamic must have been quite diverse that you're that, yeah. that you brought to t brought to the table, right? It's great. It's um, we have different perspectives, but it's interesting. Our our families have very similar perspectives. She's uh, her mom immigrated here to become a nurse, was also Catholic, married but for love. Same with my mom. She was a nurse. She's Catholic. She married for love, and um, you know the story wow. we're telling is about an Indian American tech entrepreneur who's in the height of her career in New York City. And right. her Indian mom moves in with her and announces she's leaving her husband, this oh, girl's boy. father. Um, so it's like a mother-daughter coming of age story. It takes place yeah. in the world of tech, but it also uh, explores that intergenerational dynamic between a girl born here and her mom from India. And, of course. Um, but it's, it's not the stereotypical tiger Indian mom we've seen over and over again with the thick accents. It's very much modeled after both of our moms, right? Right. right. We're very um, progressive and they don't have a big accent anymore and they don't wear saris all the time. You know, they're very Americanized. Right. Um, but they still hold on to their values. Um, so, so yeah, that's the starting point of our journey with that. And that's, that's the one with HBO right now. Absolutely. I remember when you announced it on your Instagram and I made a comment because I was like, oh my God, this is just exactly what I, I needed to read today. And, um, and it's interesting because I remember, um, you know, a number of years ago at one of, you know, the Anoki Awards shows, um, I had Sakina there and, um, mm -hmm. and I remember, you know, speaking to her about this exact same thing. And she said, you know, Raj, I'm actually tired of here. I'm, I'm totally prefacing the conversation, but she says, I'm really <laughs> tired of hearing, you know, people from our culture of creatives complaining that they're not getting the roles when all they need to do is create the roles, right? They create the roles. And this is now mm -hmm. going back probably around five years ago. Now in the last mm -hmm. five years, look at how the, 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 the landscape has changed, mm -hmm. you know, with creatives that are kind of really taking over. Look at how social media has changed the landscape. Look mm -hmm. at how streaming platforms has changed the landscape. Look at how, you know, Mindy went to Hulu, you know, Hassan went mm -hmm. to Netflix, mm -hmm. right? Here you are with HBO, you know, Priyanka um, signed the deal with Amazon to mm -hmm. do development things. It's just, what the heck is happening? Like you think to yourself, you know, what is actually going on here? Like, you know, as someone that's in the thicker things, I, you know, talk to me about what you're seeing that's going on right now in terms of South Asian representation in Hollywood. Is it, you think, the fact that there are more creators now? So therefore these creators are taking control of producing projects or do you feel it's a combination of that and the fact that social media amplification of our voices because you know hmm. we know we know how to we know how to speak up right um and then also the streaming services now looking not at hollywood and north america per se but looking at the global landscape i mean do you feel hmm. that maybe all of these things are, ch are are creating this kind of revolution that these last five years have seen happening with major, major global names 
coming out of our community in entertainment. Like, what is your take on that? Sure. I, I think everything you say, you said plays a part, plays a factor. I didn't really yeah. think about the social media component until you, you mentioned it, but I think, I think that comes into part after. You have to understand that a show can be pitched in 2017, and then it, right. it gets signed in 2018, it goes through legal development. By 2020, you're gonna start production. 2021, right. it's gonna air, right? So the social media that comes is gonna be four years later after the show is conceived. Right. Right? But by viral success on social media, that just validates the next generation to come into. But I wouldn't say it's, it's so it's not completely, it's not because I did this, this is gonna happen. It, it helps, but the payoff is much later. Right. The payoff is much later. Um, I think what's happening now is there, there are more South Asians that are interested in entertainment. You know, with my generation, it wasn't like, oh, we can do this. Like when we're five, we can be an entertainer. We found out later in life we could, but right. I think the generation below me now is starting to think sooner. I know really young, talented South Asian actresses are like 10 years old, yes. right? They're just starting, you know, their parents are first generation, so they're second generation and they're just going for it. Um, I think there's more writers on the up and up, um, producers, executives, but it's still, um, it's still a very, very small percentage. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very small. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a pipeline thing, but it's also an access thing. And I think that's some of the work we'll speak to with, um, you know, the salon, some of the advocacy work that we're doing yes. on that end. Um, so so but, why, why do you feel that the salon is coming at the right time? This is a great segue into, mm -hmm. in, in, into that considering what we've just finished talking about. Why is it coming at the right time? Um, and why did you decide that this was something that you wanted to champion and be involved with? To me, it was a no brainer. I, I didn't decide. It was just, do you want to be a part of it? Part of it? Of course. There's yeah. no no to that question. Of course. I mean, I think of that moment when Pooja Kumar told me that you're talented, you should do this. Yeah. I, it's my mission to pay that forward. Right to encourage any young girl that wants to do this, that they can do this. But yeah. for me, I was really lost. I know I hit the ground running, but then I made a lot of mistakes and I made some poor choices here and there and I had a lull and um, there were a lot of things I could have avoided had I just had someone, a dedicated person I could just go to for advice, that someone had done my path. Right. Um, and then also the salon with, serves that? Do you think that salon? That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the goal. So the mentorship program uh, applications actually co uh, close August 22nd. Okay. And this is the first batch. This is okay. the first time um, uh, they're doing anything like this. The salon is a fairly new organization. Tell uh, us a bit about it. Like, what is its mandate? Sure. It's, um, it's a forum for South Asian artists and creatives and entertainment to gather and figure out ways to help bring up the community and get more South Asians in the entertainment industry. And I think ultimately we just want more of our stories to be told, of right? Course. We want to be able to lift each other up. So members of the salon are people that can make a call, be like, get this person in the room or right. yes, I will meet with you for coffee. Let's do this. Right. So it's all about em empowering the next generation. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, so if there's anyone out there that wants to get involved with the salon in terms of either being on the side of being able to help um, open doors, um, mm -hmm. bring in resources, or on the flip side that they actually want to be a part of the program itself, mm -hmm. how can they get involved, Melanie? Um, well, there's an easy link on my Instagram profile. Just go straight to the application process if you're someone that's looking for a, for a mentee. And yeah. there should also be contact information, I think, about if you want general inquiries to the program and salon generally. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And how can they um, access salon? I know there's an Instagram page. Is there a website? Is there, uh, like What are the different ways people can... I think, I mean, there's definitely... I would imagine there's a website or there must be one coming. I think there's... I, I think there's a, I think there's a website. Hold on. Okay. I, I have my computer here. So let's check, let's check in real time right now. <laughs> so folks, if you're just joining this us, I'm talking really to actress, producer, Melanie Chandra. We're talking about her journey from mechanical engineering at Stanford to LA and some incredible projects that she's okay. done. We're also talking now about her sitting in the producer's 
chair and why she felt that this was important for her to do and why she got involved with the salon and how you can get involved also. Melanie, were you able to find if there's a website? I, I did. The, the website is thesalon.xyz. Okay. You heard it right here, folks. Go check it out. See if it's something that you feel that you would like to get involved with, either you know, on the side where you need assistance or whether you feel that you may be in a position to provide assistance because we would love, love, love that. Melanie, I want to ask you something before we close out. Um, why is it important for us as creatives in the entertainment business as South Asians to group together and help each other? Like, why do you, I mean, I know it sounds like, duh, Raj, what a question, but let's, let's talk about that for a second because, you know, I've been, being in the industry for the last 20 years, you've been in the industry for as long as you have, not everybody is apt to wanting to help each other. So like, why do you feel it's important for anyone out there listening that has always been about me, 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 um, because they feel that there's literally all, very few roles or very few opportunities out there in the entertainment business for South Asians. Like, what, what would you yeah. say to that person? I would say they have a scarcity mindset. Okay. Um, I think that there, says it all, right? <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities out there. Sometimes we just have to make them ourselves. But I think by getting more of our faces out there, by telling more of our stories, by um, having more shows that show people of color, people who look like us, we're inspiring the next generation to do bigger and better things. So my fluffy beauty pageant answer is to make the world a better place. Absolutely, I love it. It's, what it is. <laughs> it's the perfect answer as well. So, you know, I, I wanted to, I just had a thought that came into my mind that I'd love your opinion on. I, you know, if you look at these um, streaming platforms that are really kind of picking up projects that explore the diasporic story, not just our community, but also other communities. And then you look at kind of the Indian subcontinent that is going berserk now with the amount of projects that they're putting into streaming um, platforms. Of course, part of it is because cinema and theater due to COVID is where it is. So, you know, everyone's kind of going to the platform that they can actually get the audience mm -hmm. to. But let's mm -hmm. look at some of these things like Saif Ali Khan, you know, being in a Netflix original series, The Sacred Games, which was like massive, right? I think mm -hmm. it went into like three seasons or something. And then you know, people like Abhishek Bachchan going into the Amazon limited series of Breathe. I don't know if you've seen either of them, no. but they, I mean, they are not your typical Bollywood formula stories. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on, you know, here's us in North America in the diaspora and we're kind of, you know, finding ways to collaborate and to create and produce so that we can get our voices heard. Then you look at kind of the Indian subcontinent, which is also on its side, right? Um, going on a parallel journey almost, where they're also doing a lot of production that isn't your typical traditional South Asian story. What are your thoughts in terms of the possibility of merging the two quote unquote industries in terms of the amount of work that you could potentially go do there versus here because it's funny you were mentioning puja me and puja were having a conversation about a week ago and you know i was saying to her you know i i don't know if there's another south asian actress from america who's actually worked in all the major industries like she's worked in all of them so and and uh -huh. and it's coming into my yeah, yeah so it's coming into my mind so you've got hollywood she's worked in hollywood she's worked in bollywood she's done um, South Indian South movies. Indian movie. She's yeah. done like a lot of different industries. So you kind of call her quote unquote, a, an international actress, as opposed to putting a label on her as an American actress or an Indian actress. Mm -hmm. So like, like, what are your thoughts on the future for the South Asian creative kind of footprint? Do you see right. it being the emergence of a lot more opportunities on both sides of the world. What are your thoughts? Do you mean from the perspective of a South Asian creative actor, actor, or writer, or just both? Like both. all of it, yeah. all of it. 
like like I can see like here you are as an actor that has a very substantive um, profile as an actress in America, right? Mm -hmm. Then on the other side, here you are as a producer creating very very important discussion based stories that mm -hmm. you want to get out there and you want a larger audience to access. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like there's 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 all you know India's calling. It's almost like India is also calling because they're coming of age. Yeah. Yeah, I know I know I know what you're talking about. So um and there's a content boom, right? There's right, a content boom exactly. in India. Everyone's all these streamers are emerging and putting money into productions and a lot of these spaces have big slates, right? So right. um right. First, -hand ex first hand experience, one piece of insight I learned, I, I was also shopping a separate TV show, right? And we thought, oh, maybe we'll go through uh one of the streamers in India because it is yeah. an all Indian cast, okay. but it's set in New York City, but with American actors. So okay. this is what we learned. Um, and maybe things are changing since since that time period. But if a show is going to go through an Indian streamer, it has to be a little bit more specific to an Indian audience, right? Mm -hmm. And I know the Indian audience is getting more global. That's what we're right. talking about. People in India, I think, are watching Never Have I Ever, and they probably watch Master of None. Absolutely. But, um, but it's not necessarily all the case, especially if it's um, Indian the Americans. Everyday. Yeah, yeah, the everyday yeah. Indian yeah. person, as opposed to yes, the the progressive yes. Indians, right? So that's something to keep in mind. It's not a complete. It doesn't translate complete completely just because there's Indian people in a show here that Indians in India will love to take it on, right? Right. But then um, you look at you look at things like um, Indian matchmaker. Maker, and then that's became, just been a global sensation. <laughs> it's been so huge, and that I mean, yeah. if I had more time with you, I'd love to talk to you about it because I just think right. it hits on so many things that are so negative with casteism and colorism and shadism and classism and all those isms which right. in, infuriate me. But um, you know, but at the end of the day, on the positive side, there is a whole world of people who are getting exposed to how arranged marriages are done in India. And it's quite an interesting thing to watch from that perspective. You know, the fact that mm -hmm. it is getting, you know, global airplay and people are accessing it that aren't South Asian. This, I mean, it gives, it, it almost gives us way to thinking that, you know, let, you know, there is hope for us to go further mm -hmm. with this journey as creatives in the entertainment business and tell the story of South Asians. And this is mm -hmm. kind of what you're doing. I mean, tell, let's, tell me why it's important for you to tell the South Asian diasporic story. Why is it important to you on a personal level? I know that's I, like a whole episode, right? That's like a, yeah. so much that you can tell me there. If you were to like pick yeah. on the top thing that comes to you, what would it be like? Why, why do you need to tell this story? Why not just carry on down the road of mainstream primetime Hollywood America that you've been on? Why take this on? I feel like if you're in the position to do, do, mm -hmm. do. Um, but also, there are a number of reasons, but if I had to pick one right this second, mm -hmm. I want my daughter to grow up in an environment where she doesn't feel like she's, she's marginalized. Mm -hmm. I want her to grow up in an environment as an Indian American woman to feel empowered, mm -hmm. that she matters, that mm -hmm. she belongs. Right. Yeah. So, so what do you think about um, what happened last week with Kamala Harris? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, politics aside, because I'm not a political person, I'm not going to have a political conversation with you, but just the very fact that she's a consideration in an America that is still so traditional in its foundation as a society, in its foundation as as the infrastructure that it's created over these last few hundred years. And not really a lot has changed where that's concerned, where the, where the stratosphere is concerned outside of kind of the entertainment business. Um, people still are quite traditional 
outside of the urban cities. I mean, we know this, right? Um, yeah. This is why it's a big wow that even like Joe Biden said, and the word that he used was possibilities. And I feel that that yeah. is what's important here is the possibility, Melanie, that we can be whatever or whomever we want because it's what we need to feed our souls and to feed our you know, fulfillment of life, you know? And you are a yeah. testament to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that you had the opportunity to come on and chat with me about your journey and to just to be so like transparent and clear and honest about what things have been like for you and just what you said here, sweetheart, that, you know, you want to see your, your daughter grow up in a world that isn't as challenged as it has been for people like you and me, being women, being women of color, you know, it shouldn't be hard for them, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and here's somebody that's saying, Melanie, leading by example. Oh. And that's exactly, what, <laughs> that's exactly what she does. Are there any final words, sweetheart, that you want to share with everyone out there that you want to leave them with? Maybe to leave, if you, if you were to speak to, this is such a cliche question, but such an important one <laughs> for so many reasons. If you were to speak to 15 year old Melanie, what would you say to her hmm. knowing what you know today? Speak up, speak up, say what you really want out of life. That's powerful yeah. and that's palpable as you are, sweetheart. Thank you so much. It's been such Thank a you. pleasure and an honor to have this conversation with you. I feel like I just want to have so many more conversations about so many other things. You're so insightful and so clear about what you feel and believe in. And I really, really hope that we hear more from you regarding this HBO project that you are involved with and so many other projects. Come back on, come back sure. on. And you know, tell us what you got going on, sweetheart, because I'm always here to support you, as is Anoki. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Thanks. IG family. Thank you so much, Facebook family. We're going to tune off now, but please follow Melanie Chandra on all of her different social media uh, platforms. Uh, she's an incredible woman. I have watched her journey for over a decade, and she's just... She's just, she's, she's one of the good ones. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning Thank in. Thank you, baby. You know I love you. Mwah. Bye. Bye, sweetie. Bye, guys.